forget the Chinese company, right? It's ByteDance owns TikTok. Just take Airbnb, for example. Not, not a lot of people know this, but this is like front page Wall Street Journal reporting three years ago. I wrote about it a little bit more in my book. Airbnb, American company headquartered in Silicon Valley, ESG Darling, by the way, puts a neat little black square on its Instagram account to stand solidarity with Black Lives Matter. Okay, what, what do they do? They are literally handing over the American user data on their platform, pri including private messages between people who rent and the hosts on their platform, geolocational data, et cetera, as a condition for doing business in China. They don't get to do business in China unless they hand that over. Do they tell U.S. users that they're doing it? Absolutely nope. not. Wow. Did their chief privacy officer resign? Yes, he did. But, you know, Nate Blacharchik, he was a couple years ahead of me in college. What did he say? He was quoted at, and saying it internally at their meeting. We're not here. We're, what we say? We're not here to promote American values. So we in America are fine with that. We think that companies should not exist to promote American values. They should exist to sell goods and services. But the problem is, on a global stage, China does believe that those companies exist to promote Chinese values, and unless they abide by that, they don't get to do business there. So that's how they've actually turned our own game on its head. Same. And here we are playing along, going along for the ride. It, it, Ten years from now, if, if we wake up to today, I think there's something we could do about it. Ten years from now, wait to wake up to this, we're done. It's yeah. toast. Game and, over. I mean, same with our lack of capital controls. This is especially a problem in Canada, but you have all of these Chinese property buyers who are not only buying residential areas, uh, you know, entire projects, but also buying up things like ports, right? So it's it's not just the financial system. We're actually talking about physicality. China owns the West. This is not even mentioning the amount of dollars that they have in reserve, right? So I, I, I get that people are saying, oh, this is a problem we need to address militarily. China doesn't really need to lift a finger in terms of arms to, I, I would say, fatally hurt the American system at this point. They have police departments inside of the United States and, and Canada, Canada from well. the Chinese government. <laughs> yes. I mean, they have a lot of sphere of influence, but they wouldn't be here if it wasn't for Henry Kissinger and David Rockefeller going over there and opening up China to the world. That's the nice phrase that they use, but in, in, in all actuality, they just used China as a vehicle to spread globalization. They took all the factory jobs from the United States, they shipped it over there, and they made a deal with, with, with China, saying, hey, we're going to be working with you guys one-on-one. -on -one. This is the pathway by Henry Kissinger that led us here, and now we're in this situation that you're describing. So you were totally right. All right. Kissinger yeah. screwed up. No, we, no, we, no, we, no, no. We, Kissinger doesn't screw up. Kissinger, I think, is, is a brilliant human being, and I think a lot of his screw-ups actually do benefit a lot of his friends. Okay, wait, 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 wait. Kissinger screwed up in, screwed up may be the wrong word. Screwed us. No, 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 no. Yes, <laughs> screwed yes. us. Kissinger screwed <laughs> okay. everyone else over for the benefit screwed of his friends, like, he, like his policies okay. usually his do. His legacy screwed us. Okay, now, though, that's the easy part. Identifying that in the rearview mirror and blaming, you know, correctly, correctly assigning blame is the first step, fine. What do we do about it? The question is, there is a going to be a sacrifice. It is not a small sacrifice. It will be a very big sacrifice, an economic sacrifice, that we're going to have to be willing to make to say that we're not going to defeat an enemy who we depend on to supply our iPhones and our movies and the sneakers that we wear on a given day. Is that a sacrifice we're willing to make? We're not even willing to make a sacrifice to ban TikTok because kids are so addicted to it. What level of sacrifice are we going to be willing to make? It goes back to the thing I said earlier. It's like giving cocaine to the drug addict. Okay, if the drug addict can't say no to the thing they're addicted to, they're just heading in their in down the road to the black hole of their own misery. That's where we are in our relationship with China right now. We don't have it in us. We don't have the fortitude to cut ourselves off from the comforts that we're going to have to give up in the short run in order to fix this for the long run. Well, if, if you look at China's model of economic nationalism, there are things that the U.S. could copy, essentially, and and ensure that they take greater control of their own companies, their own capital. But like you said, they're not going to do it. And I, I bring this back to movies because, again, Mediaholic Channel, uh, China, you actually, they limit the number of foreign movies that you can bring into China every single year. And obviously, China's this huge market for movies, a lot of revenue. So what Hollywood does is that they actually do joint part partnerships with Chinese production. So if you ever wondered why there are so many different movies that are filmed in places like Shanghai and Hong Kong counts for these purposes, though it's an SAR, it is because if you partner with Chinese production, then you get to skirt around the quota. Now you're no longer one of the maybe 10 films or whatever it may be that they release from foreign uh, foreign production houses, now you actually count as local. So you can give as many movies as you want in China. Uh, you take a greater share of the cut. And what that means is that actually Hollywood is funding the Chinese Communist Party. Uh, and and it's, it's a smart move, but you see the United States, like you said, they would never, ever do something that bold. Uh, I guess that economic... Not 
economically national, they're not strong enough to do the that. The only thing I would say, Lauren, is, is one thing we got to be careful of, and I see this a little, a little bit of the sloppiness on the right sometimes, is there could be two very different justifications for taking similar courses of policy. One is just straight up economically protectionist. Which is to say that oh they took our jobs and you know we need to we need to, you know they're 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 making stuff cheaper than we are here. I'm not super sympathetic to the economically protectionist account of giving and coddling the American worker. What I'm talking about is the national security side of the line. And, and actually, it, it turns out that a lot of these policies can point in the same direction. But when China is viewing economic policy and military policy as two sides of the same coin. I think that when it comes to a national security question, we got to treat it as a national security issue that defends us against the one threat that actually matters to the United States. That's not in Iraq, Afghanistan, Russia, or Ukraine. It's China. But I think that we got to be careful not to make that uh, a sloppy way into anti-meritocratic American worker coddling, which I think we could use less of rather than more, even though sometimes on the right, people end up conflating you know, a lot of That's where I, I part ways with Josh Hawley and, and, and whatnot, is the justification for taking courses of action that might make sense for national security grounds don't work for me if it's just anti-meritocratic laziness. Well, I think we're at a point now where people would be more willing to accept some economic protectionism if it's in the name of national security after COVID, right? Because so many people saw that, hey, we don't actually make a lot of drugs in the United States mm-hmm. anymore. We don't make a lot of PPE in the United States anymore. So there are definitely certain industries where I think people would be willing to say, let's make the sacrifice in order to support American business. We already see that historically with American Steel, right? Because we understand the importance of wartime. I don't think people would be as willing to do that uh, for it, f- when it comes to those cheap goods that we can get at the dollar store, right? Because the, the average consumer is going to think, why am I paying more for, I, I, I don't know, whatever it may be, my toothbrush now, for, for my iPhone now. Like, how is this part of national security? That would be a really hard sell uh, in terms of policy to the to the public, I don't have an answer for that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think I think any time the, the litmus test for me is if China is using a company as a vehicle to advance a geopolitical goal, we need to treat that as what it is. It is a geopolitical question. It is a security question. It is not just an economic question. Where does that leave us? Probably banning TikTok. Um, I, I think. I, think I mean, pro- not just TikTok. We're also takes talking about a lot the of- NBA as well. We see them pushing this leftist agenda. They have big contracts with China, and they won't say a thing about free speech. I mean, it's it's even something as as simple. Some might say apolitical as sports. There's also the economic incentive. Like China is in that. They are controlling that. That's why LeBron James, despite all his BLM activism, won't say a thing about the Uyghur Muslims. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean these are again circus monkeys of the CCP, as I yeah. said earlier. Do you, do you think there could be a market solution to this? Because I, I'm thinking about this, and I, I just don't want the government deciding what we can and cannot see. I, I think a bigger solution, and this is just me being optimistic, is giving people. Uh, an internet bill of rights where you have your data, you protect your data. And I, I think the reason why there all this sabotage and spying and fifth generational warfare is going on, because it's not just benefiting the Chinese, it's also benefiting the American deep state. They're getting data sets. The, Facebook knows when you take a dump. They know everything you do. And they have garnered so they much intelligence. They knew when I was about to give birth. Exactly. Because I was exactly. Googling like pregnancy stuff. They yeah. knew not when the that. newborn was coming. But there's advertisements being sent to mothers that, that are sent before they even know that they're pregnant themselves based on their behaviors and activities that they commit on social media. So so I, I think the, the one step moving forward is saying, hey, your data, you control it. Uh, and if you want to sell it to another company, you have that right to do that. Is there a possibility for that to happen rather than the government coming in and just banning these accounts? Because I think also there needs to be a lot more public awareness at the severity of just this kind of deep state spying that's happening. I mean, I've seen libertarians argue that even something like a bill of rights for the internet would be government action in and of itself, because you can't forget if there's an internet bill of rights that also necessitates that there's some sort of penalty or enforcement. So, so so I think you're talking about fancy solutions in terms of market solutions. I think there's actually lower hanging fruit just to keep it even simpler. I think in the same way that globalization represented an opportunity in the 1990s from it, just from its raw investment perspective, I think deglobalization represents a massive investment opportunity from a capital allocation perspective over the next 10 years ahead as well. And, you know, so I'll give you, I'll give you one small example, right? I still, you know, Company. I mean, I've done business in China before, by the way. And I was exchange student my senior year of college at, at Peking University. That's you know sort of the Harvard of China, they call it. Done business in China thereafter. I've seen what that looks like. I, I said that when I founded Strive, I said, look, we're not going to do business in China. We're not. We're going to make that commitment on day one. Why do I say that? Is that because I dislike the CCP? I personally dislike the CCP, but that has nothing to do with it. It has to do with the fact that you can't be a good fiduciary to an American consumer managing an American's funds 
speaking as a vocal shareholder on behalf of American clients if you have the boot of the CCP on your neck. Now, I think that that is actually a business opportunity to operate with greater integrity, serving the American consumer unapologetically in a way that the pendulum, when it swung so far in one direction, you know, is, is sort of a classic maxim of Warren Buffett, be brave when others are fearful, be fearful when others are brave, to actually be contrarian and go in the other direction, to be an even better steward for the American customer by differentiating yourself, by making sure that the thing that differentiates you is that you are not under the bear hug or under the auspice or with a gun to your head from the CCP. And so I, I just think that deglobalization broadly and a willingness to invest f to serve the citizens of nations rather than global citizens can itself be an economic opportunity that defines probably great businesses that can be built on the back of that over the next decade. Now, operationalizing that into an internet through a tech-based infrastructure or the blockchain or, or whatever else, I mean, that, that, that gets complicated, free speech bill of rights or, or internet bill of rights. You know, th those are all thorny issues we could spend a five-hour discussion on in their own right. But I just think about even basic business builders and entrepreneurs stepping up and saying that I can, in order to put my American customer first, that itself is a business opportunity that I can liberate myself from, even if that means sacrificing the extra 30% of the opportunity that I could have gotten by going to China. And I think we're going to see more of that. Lauren, if I could just ask you, because uh, I grew up uh, in Poland during communism. My family tells me all these crazy stories about uh, what they had to go through because of the, the KGB and the government there. Do you have similar stories growing up in, in China? Does your family tell you stories of, of maybe how the social credit score was being put into place or, so, or anything like that? I mostly grew up in Hong Kong. My dad is Cantonese from Hong Kong. Um, I my views about, uh, I guess, the benefits versus cons of British colonialism have gotten me on trouble in trouble on on Twitter many a time. Um, so you know, my my parents they they've been in Hong Kong during things like the Umbrella protests, and uh, personally, I witness that every time I go back to Hong Kong, you see more and more actual propaganda. And it, for anyone who's not familiar with Hong Kong, it is one of the most developed and f I guess financially free places on on the planet. Right? Was fifteen was, was right yeah. fifteen percent flat tax. Uh, you know, you're walking down the main street, and there are all these major brands. Uh, Dior, Chanel, you name it, now with CCP propaganda uh, covered over it. So this is absolutely, absolutely something that's gotten increasingly worse over the past past few years. And, you know, there's footage of people doing things like trying to rip down uh, – Da those those data hubs essentially that are, are are trying to monitor your face. So this is something that I mean, you know, it, it's even more recent, and that's yeah. what's so scary about it because you 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 hear about these losses of freedoms and you think, think maybe Soviet Union or a generation ago, you know, maybe even further back. But no, this is actually some freedoms are actually something that you can lose in real time. And heck, even I'm going to bring it to Canada that my nationalities have not been uh, doing too well in terms of yeah. safeguarding liberties. I'm also Canadian. It's the same I'm thing sorry. in Canada. As well, I mean, you, you're freezing bank accounts now. Yep. So, like, where where are these people supposed to go at a certain point when literally, I would say, most nations are backsliding? In yeah, this way? I, I mean, I was in Hong Kong during uh, a lot of the protests there, and the way that the Chinese government squashes protests and and the measures that they put in is absolutely terrifying. I, I talked to a lot of the protesters there. I, I've done on the ground reporting. I was in the tear gas. I was in the craziness. And just the level of sophistication when it comes to their intelligence surveillance state. It's police state. It is terrifying. Right. And I think, I, I, you know, I've spoken with my husband about this before. Uh, if we are in a situation where liberty is essentially dissolving everywhere we go, I would rather live in a state that is at least less physically and technologically capable of oppressing you than one that is, right? Which is why there are so many uh, people that I know just personally... In incompetent dictatorship rather it, than a competent one. Exactly, yeah. you're right. And that's something that I think R Rousseau has, has kind of written about. I, I would rather at least a, a dictator who's only got a limited reach due to limited resources rather than, I mean, somewhere like Hong Kong, like China like Canada, and I would say in a lot of ways, yeah, like Europe. Thanks for watching this clip from the TimCast IRL podcast. Hang out with us live Monday through Friday at 8 p.m. and become a member over at TimCast.com for uncensored members-only shows exclusive. Thanks for hanging out, and we'll see you all next time.